ideas for the time being. So we'll be moving to IDN, which is the inter international domain name, where you can type also Spanish characters in the URL. And that's very important from an economy po uh, point of view, because then you can search directly with URLs. So. Because currently, if you uh, look for a product, the top 10 are going to be those websites that have been well designed in terms of metadata into them, since the Americans are very good at that. Most of the people that are looking for products, they will get directly the first top 10 websites coming from the US. And it's also cool to uh, buy products in the US, and they know how to ship worldwide and so on. So but it's, uh, it's not very good for uh, the local, local economy, especially for the big ones. So the big nations like Spain, France, Germany, Italy, uh, they have also their own you know, big culture, and the language is enough for them. If you look at um, India, it has seven languages. They're talking about a billion people. So, so, so you have to give them their own uh, IDN uh, as such. And this has, has been just released by ICANN back in, uh, in December. So you will see in the future that uh, the majority of the internet websites are not going to be English. Most probably won't be able even to connect to them because you'll have to type the URL as well. This does not mean that the internet would be fragmented and so on and so forth. It will just reflect the world society. All languages are going to be represented. Okay? Now let me explain to you how the internet functions. So, uh, this is, uh, you know, after your siesta, um, I have to compete with your uh, uh, stomach juice. Uh, so if you think you have invented the web lately, let me tell you that you're wrong. As a matter of fact, the web was created a long time ago, a couple of million years uh, ago. So this little thing, uh, you, you can imagine this, um, uh, this event. This is a test that has been done by NASA recently you know, to, to see uh, how animals react to different um, uh, products. Uh, instead of taking, let's say, a pig, uh, it takes a long time until you know uh, what's the impact on him. So they took uh, this little spider, and I made a correlation between this spider and the impact of what are products and the same thing that's happening to the internet uh, currently. Okay? So this spider, he sees flying food, and he says, how can I capture it? It takes a lot of uh, brain work. And you know, set a vertical uh, net. All of them are, are vertical because then the food is going to hit that place, and it's all from his entire body. No tools, it's all from his own, own body, which is uh, quite amazing. Huh? So, um, in this experiment, what they have done, they have sprayed, at the beginning, just uh, caffeine on the spider. And then the spider started losing its engineering design and capability. So if you are an engineer and you're drinking coffee, I would like you to check on your intake. Uh, so you might not even realize what's happening to your brain, right? Then they went on with the... So this is where, in the internet, at the beginning we had the end-to-end -end model. Those networks had their own IP addresses, so permanent global IP addresses. And by the beginning of the 90s, 95, NAT has been introduced for one of the reasons is to conserve the address space. But then it was used by the telecom operators in order to create walled gardens. So they will not give you a global IP address, but just a private IP address so that you are a captive customer and you cannot room that easily. So you stay with them. Hence, you don't change email addresses that, that quickly. But in fact, you even stick to it for a long time because it becomes your identity as well. So here on this thing, they sprayed marijuana on it, and then it lost the engineering totally. In the internet, we call it network address translation. I think one of the previous speakers has talked about this one. It's, it's a good technology. It has created just one-way internet that killed the two-way internet. Okay, so for all the engineers that are here, and I would like to check Maybe in this room, uh, who has his own global IP address in this room? That's bad news. Then you are not internet engineers. You're just net engineers. So if you are in the gaming, 
So you're doing most probably OLAs, but that's not the internet, that's not end-to-end. -end. So you need your IP address in order to do that. Then you become part of the internet. So this is where basically we have put marijuana on the internet. We call it marijuana net. Okay? And then uh, some of the people could um, create traversal technologies like stun or turn. This is what Skype is using in order to find out what is your current global IP address. Then they can cross all the nets and then make that communication happen between whoever based on that. Huh? So this is a stopgap solution. It's a hack on the internet to make it look like we have the end-to-end. -end. But when you have NAT boxes in between, it means they read the packets, and especially the header, and they change the IP address. When you change the IP address, in security, security box says, well, somebody has messed, messed around with the header. This is not acceptable. It drops the security connection. Hence, we don't have internet security today. This is one of the biggest issues we have. So in order to restore security, you need to have that end-to-end -end model. So just the, the short history of the internet. There is a little story behind it. Uh, back in 57, uh, when, um, when the Americans, especially the uh, FBI and CIA, they heard a beep in the sky. And it took them three days to find out, oh, it's a Sputnik and making that sound. And that has uh, basically, it's, it was like the 9-11 the thing in those days. How come that the Russians are ahead of uh, the Americans? Um, so, um, so that was the decision in 58 to have an answer to this one. And then the famous ARPA has been created, Agency for Research. Um, which uh, culminated uh, 10 years later in two things. On the 17th of July, that was the uh, Apollo uh, uh, launch. And on the 2nd of September, the first internet, in this case, the ARPANET. And the addressing scheme of this one had only two to the power eight. So you could have only 256 networks connected. But at that time, it was mainframes. And back in 52, Thomas Watson from IBM, he said he would never sell more than four mainframes. So obviously 256 mainframes, that's a big chunk. But, uh, but around 1972, you had about 1,000 mainframes installed. The first one only for the sensor uh, system or for the meteorology and so on and so forth. And then uh, ARPA has asked a few people like um, Vince Cerf and uh, Bob Kahn, you know, to look at how can we increase the address space, and then how can we move from a connection uh, system similar to the uh, phone system to a connectionless. So in this case, the difference between connection and connectionless, when you make a phone call to somebody, if he's not there, then the communication is dropped. A connectionless thing, I can send an email and it can wait for him until he comes in order to read that. Okay, so this is the difference between, between the two. And um, the internet, I'm not going to go into the details, but was started in the 1st of uh, January 1983. Uh, there are about, uh, in this case, about 100 people involved in that work. And still, uh, by end of December uh, 1982, 50 of them have not realized that they have to switch from NCP, which used to be the protocol for uh, uh, um, ARPANET, Network Control Protocol, and now to move to IP, in this case, IPv4. And it took about six months until everyone has moved to IPv4, and for six months, email didn't work. And so you can imagine moving from IPv4 to IPv6. It's, a, it's another story. It's not 100 people. It's 2 billion people we have on this planet. So. But um, the internet has given us primarily address space to connect 25% of the world population. And that's it. But that's the beginning of the digital divide, because it's the richest people on planet, and the rest will have to wait until a new solution has been designed uh, for them. So hence, um, the work on IPv6, which already started back in 92, to your surprise, 
and we've been promoting it since uh, 1999 through the creation of the IPv6 forum uh, with a worldwide uh, community in 72 countries. So we have chapters, we have also chapters in Spain. But the community unfortunately is uh, quite small, but the Spanish government is very much involved. So Red Ears and so on, all of them do have IPv6 at least for the last six years. So the entire research networks and most of the ISPs have ready the backbone with IPv6 and will be able to do that. So, so the good news for you in this case, anyone has IPv6 uh, enabled on his laptop? One, two. Who has Vista in this, uh, at this place? Uh, anyone that has Vista? No? You are not installing Vista? It's all Linux in this place? Linux, you have V6. On Vista, it's by default. And Windows 7, by default. So as soon as Telefonica lights up IPv6, you'll connect with IPv6 first. You won't even notice. Eh? So it's only up to the ISPs to, to do that work. And then you will be able to do the many things that you would love to do in a simple way. Gaming, peer-to-peer, -peer, just name it. All the stuff that is done in a complex way today would be done in a simpler way. Especially when you know what's the IPv6 address of the other person on the, on the line and you, then you can do a secure communication. So you'll be doing personal VPNs, which today you cannot do. You'll have to buy a VPN from a security house. So you've been basically dialing in a way with an IP address primarily with an IP, with a private IP address, through a global IP address, so that translation had to happen. And the, and the good thing is that it has to be always on. And the, in conferences where we, which we do around the world, we do about 10 years, so we have always IPv6 in such a thing. Unfortunately, here in this network, it's not done, so we'll make sure next time it is. Then you'll start enjoying IPv6. So in the other conferences, we connect to V6 first. Then you have faster connection and so on and so forth. Obviously, not too many people are using IPv6 uh, for the time being. But that changes totally the model. And if you had one Vista here, I can connect with you right away. You'll see this presentation on your laptop without doing anything. And this creates an instant wireless peer-to-peer -peer communication between the two because this laptop has a link local IP address like private IP address, and yours as well, and then we'll do a peer-to-peer com -peer communication. And if you had Vista, all of you, we can shut down this one because you'll see my presentation on your laptops right away. And everyone in this room, okay? That changes totally education, e-learning, and so on and so forth. All of these things are going to change. That's what it will be a, a, a tremendous uh, uh, thing. So you've been just tourists on the internet and you want to have some kind of a green card on the internet. So these are the protocols. So now, if we look at the, the steps it has taken for IPv4 and IPv6, I'll go quickly through this um, uh, stage of history. So V4 was designed between 73 and 78. There are certain similarities in V6 between 92 and 98. And uh, V4 was ready in 78, V6 in 98, and promotion, it took also the same time of, uh, of, uh, of time, you know, to get everyone to be involved. First deployment of uh, V4 was in 83, and in IPv6 we expect a kind of global acceptance from the major ISPs and governments around the world uh, by this time, which is happening. One of the things that happened to IPv4 is that the US government and the European governments, all of them, between 86 and 95, shut down IP, period. And they were using another protocol based on OSI called CNNP. It was, to a certain extent, similar to IPv6, but it has just 64 uh, uh, bits addressing. So this didn't happen, happen to IPv6, so in this case, uh, the uh, acceptance will be quite important. And the U.S. Congress opened the Internet for uh, public use starting in 92. And this is where Al Gore uh, has contributed tremendously to this because he got that law passing through the Senate. But he made a little mistake saying that he invented the Internet. 
And I think uh, you can give that to him. So whenever I travel to the US, I ask taxi drivers, who has invented the internet in the US? They say, all of them, yeah, it's Al Gore. So it's, it's that, that little sentence has impact on people that don't know. So, so basically, we have moved from the real internet to an internet. Uh, so you're not working on the internet at all. This is a totally different beast. And it's all fragmented. Networks are fragmented. You can do security uh, acro crossing all the networks. Impossible. Especially when you have now this cloud computing coming. I'll touch on it. So cloud computing has to be, in this case, a private cl uh, cloud computing. It cannot be across, uh, across, across domains. It's just impossible because we don't have the IP addressing for it. You need global IP addressing, transparent, and, and uh, non-modified. So now with the penetration of uh, the Ethernet by 2020, you would, expe you would expect this slide is old. You would expect to reach something like 90% penetration of the Ethernet, similar to the uh, mobile phones today. So we have about 90% uh, mobile phone uh, penetration. It's, it's quite normal that email is going to, uh, to go into things like you know, not only iPhone, but any gadgets that cost $20 will have also uh, some kind of browsing and so on and so forth. But then again, you'll have the other things that are waiting for us to connect to them and to manage them differently. Smart devices, so you'll hear about smart grids, internet of things, uh, the, the, the various uh, things to look at the entire food chain from production over to your fridge. And then you'll be able to maybe get your fridge to connect to your uh, shopping mall, you know, to find out what is the latest offer or, or what is the latest food uh, that is uh, on offer, and then he will be able to place an order and so on. Those scenarios are possible. They are impossible today with IPv4. It would be very complex to do. There are certain sh solutions uh, uh, in that uh, area, but they will not be uh, done for everyone. And if we look at the the structure of the internet today, it's, it's a silo. It's like what we had with the telecom world. It's happening to the internet as well. So we have silo as well. So if you want to do voice over IP crossing all of these domains, you can do that. So you need a superb company like Skype to do it for you. And that would be an expensive one. That's why we have only one Skype. And uh, uh, the inventor is, I live in Luxembourg, he's next door to me, he's born also in Luxembourg. And we have these chats and he says, well, you know, why don't you do, do it on IP? He says, well, do you have 200 million V6 users? Then I'll do that. It would be easier for me to do. But I need customers. So he's putting a lot of effort to make sure that crossing each net is not going to disturb the quality of uh, voice and, and so on and so forth. And now you can even do screen sharing and that kind of stuff, which is changing uh, uh, dramatically the, the scene. And V6, you will have that end-to-end -end integration of the various services. So between governments, enterprise, users, with a certain option for security between people and the option to, be, to have a certain privacy. So privacy has been also added to IPv6, while in IPv4 you don't have a privacy at all. So if you, if you use an IPv4 address, especially if you have DSL and the IP address stays, remains at least for a couple of days the same. So if you go to um, certain websites, they are going to leave the footprints of yourself. Because in Europe we have the law of tracking the logins. So what happens in each country, every telecom company has to keep between 6 to 12 months, depending on the country, the logs of your, uh, uh, of your websites. So if you are a criminal, they have the right to go and look at that. So watch what you're doing. Huh? And so they are not telling you these things. So. And it's, it's consuming tons of hard disk for the telecom operators to keep that data all the time. Yeah? So, but if you have IPv6, you have one single IPv6 address but with the option to use a, what we call, randomized IP address, so it changes. When you go to any website, then the IP address will be uh, scrambled, and nobody can find where you have been. Yeah, so this is a privacy feature that we have added to IPv6, and it comes automatically with, the, with Vista. So you get always two addresses, a global one, 
and a randomized one. When you go on, the, on to websites or on the internet browsing, automatically the randomized one will be used. And if you want to do end-to-end -end communication like voice or IP or gaming and so on, then you can choose to use your, your global IP address, V6 in this case, either in the clear or secure. Oh, so you have these three options, which you don't have today with IP4. So this is the debate we had, and, and uh, some of the people asked me, how come a lot of people said that the address space is going to, to uh, you know, wind up uh, you know, soon? So we had one gentleman called Jeff Houston, based in Australia, quite, a, quite a, an expert, and he misled the, the entire world by saying that the address space will last until 2030. And this put a lot of comfort in the ISPs because they didn't want to invest. They said, oh, this is good. In the meantime, we have done the study and we found out that you know, there is only 7% of the address space left. And worse is that from the 22 blocks that we have, so this is the address space, uh, the, the 2 to the power of 32, which gives you um, 256 blocks. And in each block you have 16 million. Am I too fast? So 16 million. And we have consumed, so we have only 350 million left. And we have found out that from these 22 left, only two are clean. And the other 20 are what we call in, uh, in internet speak, dirty addresses, which means they are used by either hackers, spammers, VPN. It's like we were in, in a conference in Valencia uh, yesterday, and the wireless uh, provider just you know, typed an IP address because he didn't have one. And we checked on it, and that address belongs to the University of uh, Toronto. So it was not functioning all the time. It was on and off. Just because they didn't have an IP address uh, handy. So just, just typed in one. And this is what's happening today. So this is uh, what we call the uh, lobster syndrome. So, you know, you take a lobster, put it in a pot, and then put a bit of uh, heat. So it feels uh, comfortable. And then uh, a competition just basically cook him. So those that are not going for IPv6 are going to be in this in this thing, and it would be similar to the Y2K. So I think if you're not doing IPv6, you'll have the same bug like uh, the Y2K as well. My laptop CPU is uh, fainting, so I'll have to wait for this thing to happen. You know what happens? Uh, yes, uh, that's what happens. So, so you need to have uh, vision, strategy. Uh, so I guess if you look at, at the plane on the other side, uh, so you should never be happy with your current status and say, oh, you know, address space is like oxygen, it just happens in, in the open air, it's not my issue and so on. No, it is your issue. You have to understand these things. And this is one of the problems that, especially in Europe, we are not really that much of a networking nation. This is the US. But the biggest surprise is coming from China. It's absolute networking uh, geeks. Uh, they understand IPv6. Uh, yeah, absolutely, in, in, in detail, because you have a range of features that do not exist in, uh, in IPv4, uh, so they are trying to uh, use them and understand them, how they can be used and so on, because we have not discovered all the features that, that exist in there that are embedded, especially multicasting, the different uh, addresses like Anycast, and, and Anycast address is just, it's like uh, you have um, uh, the fire brigade which is uh, driving around, and then one wants to, to alert one of, the, one of them, so it's the next possible uh, uh, fire brigade that is nearer to him will get the message, and so it will s spread like, like this, so without even knowing which IP address exists. And these are features that we have not yet uh, 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 adopted uh, uh, very well. So if you um, know one of the inventors of the internet, his name is Vint Cerf, and he's also the honorary chairman of the IPv6 forum. And this is basically what we have done to his work. Huh? We just scrambled it and we made out of the internet a telecom uh, uh, infrastructure. It has nothing to do with the original design. So I'll just list some of the features that IPv6 will uh, take us from, so currently from, uh, let's say, the 4.3 billion IP addresses, we can use only 3.7. And from the 3.7, uh, normally you should have maximum 500 million hosts. Currently we're at 700 million. So somebody has fished out some IP address in order to do that. 
So with IPv4, you can have easily 500 million hosts. But now we are moving into billions of devices. So sensors and these things are going to, to join as well. So for that to happen, you need an IPv6 address. And the IPv6 address is not one. You'll get a chunk, which is normally a slash 48. It's as much address space as for the current internet, for each one of you, whether you like it or not. So you just get them. So I must probably be using just two or three, but that's uh, how uh, this thing is done. But it's important to have them because you would need auto configuration. So the 64 bits inside will help you in how to do auto configuration. Yeah? So, so, so that, that functionality is an absolute must. The next one is auto configuration. So we're moving into, into commodity networking. So you're not going to get an engineer to walk around with a 3G device or LTE device or a sensor just in order to do that. It has to happen by in, uh, in an automatic way. The next one is uh, even more important. Now, YouTube is just the beginning of the video. Every one of you will be doing his own YouTube, so my tube. So currently you produce something and just give it to someone. So this is a kind of just just archiving the stuff. Um, just not the internet. The internet is I produce it, I broadcast it, and people look at it, my stuff. Not that I have to put it on the, somebody else. So this is the old model. The new model is everyone can have his own YouTube from your, your device directly. Obviously capacity and so on and so forth. But at least for the people that you have decided to show them your videos, either live or archived, then they'll be able to connect to you because you have a global IPv6 address from anywhere in the world. You're not going to let six billion people knock at your thing because it will just collapse. So, but for those clo you know, loved ones that you have, you want to show them a picture of the conference or you know, the speech that you are doing, you can tell them this is the audience and the six people can see it right away. And this is doable today and we have done it in many occasions. Obviously, uh, mobility, so 3G and 4G, it's really not the internet, but they will be using IPv6 because you are not going to surf on 3G and see what 3G is doing and so forth. That's not going to be the case. It's like you can surf on the phone system. You can surf at the website of the telecom companies, but you cannot surf directly on the devices. But when you get IPv6, voice over IP, using SIP and so on, the surfing will be different. So you'll be surfing with voice. You'll be going to people directly, which today you can do. You have to call someone because this is connection oriented. You want to have connectionless oriented. So, so, so there are many things that we cannot do today the way it should be done. And the security as well. So the end-to-end -end model is the, the best internet is the internet that does not touch packets. They go from source to destination. And when they arrive at destination, then the destination says, are you the source? And then the source has to say, yes, I am the source. This is not possible today. The source sends it to the destination. And since the destination is just a website, just says, are you the, the net box in between? Yeah, I think, I think you are the one. So I'll send you a copy of the, in this case, of the website. So you get copy sent to you. But if it is a voice call, secure, or let's say in this case a VPN, so when a VPN starts, it sends a package to the destination. The destination says, are you that IP address? If it's not the IP address, it's a, it's a, a private one. Then the global IP address that has been used in order to send that message will say, well, no, it's the other one. Then this one says, well, I cannot trust you because I wanted to have the confirmation for this one. So this is uh, fundamentally the first step for security. And then the security stack just says, no, I don't want to have that connection. So you have to be an expert in order to do that. And basically, we would like to have security to be for everyone. Uh, that, that's, it's going to be commodity and done for everyone. I will not go into detail, uh, you know, what it takes and how to do and so on and so forth. But since you are people that understand peer-to-peer, -peer, yeah, this, is, this will be fun. Because we'll move from one-way internet, so I see most of the people that are surfing on it to find things. That's not the internet. 
internet is an active one, so I can collaborate with. It's more fun when I'm uh, having a, a discussion with somebody else. Now, in this case, live streaming and so on and so forth, all of these experiences are not yet with us. You can do it on the phone, but it will be you know, a lot better doing it on, uh, on the internet with a certain security. So, so many small case models that we can do with IPv4 now will be able to do them in, with IPv6 in a larger scale. And this is where uh, people are asking you for uh, killer applications. Uh, so I'll just list a few. So if you're looking for a killer application, basically networking as such is not a killer application uh, as such. It just gives you the, uh, the platform you know, to create killer applications. And this is a statement made. I didn't uh, put the video on this one. You would have listened to him. So the first killer application of, the, of IPv6 is the internet itself. So don't look for another one. Sustaining the growth of the current internet is very important. So as I said uh, uh, previously, that we have used the entire V4 address space in order to connect 20% of the world population. How about the other 80%? And that's the biggest thing we can do is to have a big internet community because it is a source for many things, cultural, business, uh, social networking, and so on and so forth. Currently, it's only you know, a small fraction of the world population which is, which is on board. So this is an absolute uh, must in order to do that and sustain the growth of the internet. And then you can start looking at you know, how should we do VPN so that VPN becomes commodity. It's not an expensive thing. Voice over IP, 3G, gaming, NGN, triple play, remote control, embedded uh, technologies, WiMAX, home networking, grid, PLC. As a matter of fact, Spain is a champion in PLC with the company in Valencia. IPTV, an example of IPTV using V6 in Japan. It has 11 million users using IPv6 multicast. Uh, so so it's, a, it's a tremendous uh, opportunity. You won't be able to do IPTV in such a good way. You see that on triple play, if you have bought triple play in, in Spain or I have it in Luxembourg, you know, the packets are miserable. So all of a sudden, it just, the, the quality is not, uh, not assured. No? You get uh, RFID, building automation, sensors, emergency. Some examples that uh, has been, have been done in a big way, and this is where governments play a major role in driving uh, uh, large-scale uh, technologies. So the U.S. government, uh, through Obama, you should know that uh, uh, George Bush hated research and science and communication. Whenever he mentioned, talked about the internet, he always said the internets in plural. So he has been cutting uh, research money for the uh, researchers in uh, during his uh, tenure. And the new administration has been putting a lot of funding for broadband to the rural areas, so to, to, to the people that are not connected at all. As a matter of fact, in the U.S., uh, some parts of uh, the U.S. do not have even access to the Internet. The U.S. Uh, uh, U.K. government has just installed a broadband policy using IPv6. In Australia, a similar scenario, there is a tele Telstra, which is uh, normally a government uh, organization, and they refuse to deploy broadband across uh, Australia. So through a parliament decision, they have decided to create a new company uh, for uh, 43 billion Australian dollars and then give broadband to everyone. That was the only way to do that uh, uh, as such. This is a project in uh, Germany called Deutschland Online. This will be really a, a good use case uh, scenario so what happens, and it's not different uh, here in uh, Spain, so, so in uh, Germany is uh, uh, 16 lenders. And so, so the governments, you have the communes, and then the regional uh, states, and then the federal state. And the total of networks are about 26,000 networks. Yeah. So all of these networks, they have private IP addresses. And so, so, so if you want to send an email from a private network to another private network, the likelihood of having IP address collision is quite strong. It's like the same phone number is calling the same phone number. So you will just hear it's busy. 
And the reason for it is that it was not designed in a way that it was uh, planned and so on and so forth, which is quite uh, uh, unusual for, uh, for Germany. So the mayor has just installed his network through the local company and so it has happened in the other places. So they don't have hierarchical addressing scheme which is giving each device, or in this case each host, its IP address. So when they want to send an email, they go through an ISP. When they go through an ISP, it's not secure, so most of the email in the German government is in the clear, so it's not secure. So we, we met them back in 2007 and we said the only way to have end-to-end, -end, and in this case just for email, is to put an IPv6 uh, overlay on top. That all the communications among the uh, government agencies, they will be using IPv6 for an end-to-end -end co communication, and in this case it can be secure. Now their plan was to rehaul everything, uh, the budget for this project is uh, 4 billion euro, although the portion for IPv6 just comes because they said we'd like to have IPv6 in the routers and so on and so forth. But in fact, you get it for free. Uh, so it's uh, part of the, the, the stack. So, so this is a very important um, uh, project to show how to do that. If you take, for instance, uh, African countries. So an African minister comes to the United Nations uh, meeting in Geneva. So most of the time, they don't even have a, an email server at their place with its own global IP address. So you cannot open a VPN in order to read these emails. So most of them, they use Yahoo emails or Gmail. Now, when you are a minister, the first guy is going to follow you is the FBI or CIA, which they do, because they have the right to look at these, uh, these things. Watch your emails, whatever you say, so don't insult the US, because then you will be uh, somebody who is going to wait for you at the customs. Huh? really do that. And so be careful about what you're doing. So, so in this case here, because of the lack of global IP addressing, matter of fact, I would not uh, be surprised that even the Spanish government, when they travel, they don't have a VPN. I must probably don't even know how to open a VPN. And uh, I would expect them also to use Yahoo and Gmail addresses. So, so uh, this is uh, where IPv6 comes in. And Microsoft has introduced a year ago one of the first uh, easy to use worldwide uh, IPv6, IPsec uh, secure application that comes uh, automatically with the server and the host. So what, this is what they do. And it's, it will change uh, totally security because security is very difficult to do especially you need the key associations and so on and so forth, which is a nightmare for many. And this application doesn't need keys. So what they do is they say, we have the core network of the corporation that needs to be secure. Any host within the corporation or outside of the corporation is, a, is an internet user, even within the company. So just the core network is secure. The rest is insecure. So. When people within the company or in a uh, coffee shop or in a hotel connect to the internet, they connect automatically in a secure way using IPv6. In this case, they have a, a protocol called Teredo and creating a tunnel, an IPsec tunnel, and they connect automatically to the network without doing anything. When normally what you have to do is when you go to a coffee shop, you want to connect to the corporate network, you, you open a VPN. If you open a VPN, it's tough to do, because through it you cannot go to the, uh, through, through, you know, to surf on the internet. So you cut it down and then just do your private stuff. And the majority do, first of all, private stuff and then connect to the VPN. And this will allow any company to create its own uh, secure access for its people traveling and so on and so forth using this one in their network and they don't need to pay for a VPN. It will be just connect, I can surf and also at the same time I can connect to my, my enterprise. This is an absolute fantastic solution. And as soon as, you know, it's unfortunate it's, uh, Microsoft is doing it, but it will create the model for all the other companies to do the same thing. And this is a radical paradigm change in security. Taking a bit of time to flip. 
I have uh, spoken to a hacker. He's fairly famous, one of the famous hackers in, um, in Europe called Fen uh, Hauser. So I asked him, you know, did you look at IPv6? And he looked at it and checked in it. So he found a few things. So, so scanning, so if you want to scan the internet, it takes 10 minutes. You can scan all, let's say, 700 million IP addresses, and you wouldn't know where the servers are. And then you can say, okay, I want to spam them or I want to hack them and so on. So that's the current internet. So he says that a live scanning and TCPI warming basically very hard to do. So all the viruses that are transported through scanning, that, that, that's, that's the end of that. So viruses will continue to go through the application. It's only when we have designed new application based on IPv6 and identifying the networks, then in this case we'll be able to stop spamming and viruses at the application layer. But at the networking layer, that's, that's the end of, uh, of viruses and worms. So. Some of the other things that uh, uh, exist uh, on IPv4 is called broadcast. It's like in television broadcast. We do the same thing on, IP, on IPv4 on the internet. And that's uh, bad for, um, uh, for security because when you broadcast it, any hacker can find, oh, this is a broadcast, so it's coming from this place. In this case, I can hack it. That was eliminated in, in IPv6, uh, so which is uh, not an important feature. And there are many other features that uh, he has found out that will make it very hard for, for hackers and not to go after IPv6. So at least we are delaying the time until they find out new ways in order to do that. Huh? So cloud computing, for instance. So cloud computing is a trusted model. As I said earlier on, cloud computing is a private, it's the first cloud of the richest companies like Amazon, Google, and so on that want to create a trusted internet in order to give services, cloud services, I'll show you an example uh, later on, uh, in order to allow companies not to buy uh, hardware and software and so on and so forth. All they need is a terminal. Then they can use the applications of uh, cloud services and do that. Amazon introduced this just because they have overspent in uh, in infrastructure and they had plenty of capacity empty, so they started selling their services to others. Like becoming, let's say, an outsourcing uh, a thing. Then created uh, the, the cloud. As you know, the internet is a cloud itself. It's just insecure. That the difference is that they want to give you a certain uh, security. And, uh, and in order to do that, you need to have global IP addressing end-to-end. -end. So you can do security on, on, on top of that. So this is where NAT countries that do not have enough V4 address space will not be able to create their cloud services in their country. So it will still depend on Amazon uh, and the likes uh, services in order to achieve this. So, so this is the, the uh, next thing is the uh, Internet of Things. I'll show you a little uh, presentation how, how Internet of Things can be done. By the way, if you're looking for uh, uh, something totally different from, um, from PowerPoint, and you want to do some fantastic uh, new style PowerPoint, just to go to the company called Prezi.com and download the software. You'll be quite amazed. So this is a, a French company that has created a software. So it's using, it's using cloud software called SaaS, software as a service. The, the, the difference is that it's simply it has interfaces, so you can connect to Facebook and Twitter and so on. You can publish data right away, so you don't have to retype it. So it's automatic. So this is one, one element of the software uh, as a service type of thing. And you will be able to share that information. So you have the interfaces in order to connect to other places. So, so if we look at, for instance, uh, the, the company itself, so they present them as a SaaS software house and doing envir environmental management, just web-based, and they have a database and they check uh, real-time on energy consumption, so this is part of the Internet of Things uh, stuff, and they have the tools to do that, and uh, through all of these tools they get this uh, real-time energy monitoring. So you can publish everything on, on an iPhone. And so you have uh, IPv6 network sensors. Uh, these are the very first one in the world. Most of the sensors are Zigbee oriented. So this is first, second generation uh, uh, sensors. And the new ones will be IP based. 
And if you want to have really direct, traceable, and connectable, and so on and so forth, they'll have to have their own IP address, in this case, uh, v6. And uh, using that software, then you'll be able to show some of the things, uh, examples like, you know, I can see the temperature of the building. So it's in the area of between 23 and uh, 24 degrees. So the recommendation, you should, you know, cut it down to uh, 19. Dirt that uh, can speak French uh, in this corner here. And, and then it shows you the consumption of uh, electricity, uh, of, of, uh, of the heating system. So it's going up and down over the entire day. And then it tells you that, you know, 40% of the energy of the building is consumed just for, for the heating. So they have certain uh, recommendations. This is happening automatically. So they can give you some numbers that, for instance, uh, by using, so this is the, the router connected to the printer. And the printer is using recycled paper. And it tells you by doing that, you're saving something like 20, uh, 20 uh, times uh, less trees and, and 90 times less water. And, uh, and, and these features are going to be, let's say, will give a certain understanding how Internet of Things is going to, to play uh, its role. It's, it's no more abstract as such. Then you can publish this you know, on whatever device, for instance, on, on Facebook. And you can share the data with, with your friends and so on and so forth. So this is the, the type of, uh, of uh, application that you'll be able to do using V6. Uh, and the new type of uh, cloud services uh, that uh, are going to, uh, uh, to change a bit. And then you will be going to uh, the global sensor networks uh, for, for a certain uh, wider applications in the home, we have also many spots that are going to be smart, so we'd like to have smart metering and, uh, and the likes. And be able to use it also for e-health, uh, uh, for natural disasters. Uh, in the case of emergency and so on, uh, most of the time the communication is flat. So the most important uh, feature is voice so that the fire brigade and the police and so on, they have to talk to each other. That's the only, that's the most important feature. So you have to create on the fly network in order to able, enable all of them to talk to each other. And this you can do with IPv6, on the fly. Just have to get a, uh, 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 just a little truck with an IPv6 network that creates a Wi-Fi and voice over IP over the Wi-Fi, and all of them, if they have these Wi-Fi devices, then you'll be able to talk to each other. And this is off the shelf. You don't have to invent something new, like we have currently these Tetra devices. So the fire brigade has these big phones. And by the way, they're just GSM. But they cost 1,000 euro. And inside is GSM, which you can get for free from any ISP. From. And when you take uh, the fire brigade of uh, Spain, uh, France, and Luxembourg, and Germany, and put them together, they can't talk to each other because they're not using the same frequency. Because some vendors they think it's secure not to connect to the other guys. Interoperability, yeah? So this is, um, but it's one way for these vendors to say, you know, I, I know how to do these things better than the other guys, so they lock out the markets. This is where interoperability in IP is fundamental, because it creates uh, competition between, uh, between these guys. I'll finish uh, quickly uh, on this one. I see in front of me uh, some autonomic uh, uh, people. So this is, uh, you know, nature, uh, you know, the plants and the trees, they basically are solar energy uh, uh, users. Uh, so they use solar energy and are to create themselves. You know, from there, they create their own, uh, their own uh, body themselves, which is the leaves, and, and they grow. And, and they sophisticated the, very much their, their nature, the, in a sense that um, some of the trees and some of the plants, they even use their sex organs in order to produce fruits and vegetables. Ah, I don't think a human being can do this one. Yeah, so so it's, uh, it's quite amazing that just from, from solar energy, uh, this nature has been created. And the human being has def decided not to be dependent on solar energy, because most probably didn't want to have the, f the four season on his face all the time. No, most probably I'm, I'm a bit, bit tired, so I'm, I have most probably a winter face on, on, uh, on myself. Yeah. So, so it's, it's uh, quite interesting to see that the human being has designed a, an autonomic uh, nervous system that takes care of you. So you sit in front of me, 
and your autonomic system takes care of your breathing. Can you imagine if you had to breathe like you eat? It would be just ventilating all the time. So you don't need even to think about that. Or the heart beating, the heart beat is also regulated by your nervous system. And the blood circulation and all of the things that allow you to be free to listen to my talk or to do things that are fundamental. You can imagine if I have to breathe <laughs> all the time, like I eat and I have to speak to you, that would be, that would be quite, quite a circus. So. And this concept slowly will be moving to the internet. And so we create an internet which is similar to the nervous system to take care of itself. And this is where autonomic computing is quite important. So. And that will be able to do, I think I'll skip this one. I'll come uh, quickly to, uh, so this is where Nat's uh, introduction to the internet is stopgap. It has helped with the address space, but it destroyed uh, exactly the concept of the internet, the original one. So, so you've been uh, basically seeing just uh, the web and mail and some smaller scale applications uh, in other things. But with V6, we'll be able to do something like 10 large scale applications as big as the web or peer-to-peer -peer and so on. And many of them are going to be uh, visible two-way uh, internet that uh, are burgeoning slowly. The majority of these things have been already done in China and Japan and Korea. Uh, especially Japanese, they create, invented everything, but the internet, so they are taking their revenge with, with IPv6. Huh? And you will be buying, you are already buying products, Panasonic cameras and so, uh, so on. They all have IPv6 in there. So all you need is Telefonica, and then all of a sudden you connect with your camera. And you can send, click an image, and it's, it's sent directly to your whatever, Facebook, if you have the interface to it. Okay? <clears throat> so basically what we are doing, we're not inventing anything new. All we're doing is, um, if I get this slide done, is just getting that face back. Huh? All right? And... And it is a big, big task. So those that have been uh, trying to find the mistakes on the slides, which one it is? Uh, now you have forgotten uh, the prime question. Uh, so I might have misspelled that one. So if you just look at this slide here, what's the mistake? Uh, this one. With this one, no, I know. This one, on this slide, what is the, what's the mistake in there? Right. As a matter of fact, you have all passed uh, the exam because you didn't even uh, notice the, the, uh, the, the, the typos. Uh, the purpose was, when I have a large uh, audience, it's just to keep them captured. So I put this one. And the majority, they come up with things like yours, hundreds, just to have the pin. Huh? But here, at least you're decent. That was my message. Thank you. So do we... <clears throat> I, can take, I can take a couple of questions. So, so we have the chairman. Uh, So, any, any question, or should I ask you a question? So, I have also a, a couple of uh, papers that I can uh, do a kind of test here for all of you. <laughs> Anyone? No? That's one. Thanks for breaking the ice. Uh. Okay. Um, do you expect any resistance to changing to IPv6 from vendors like Cisco or uh, the, one, the vendors who, who make money with, with NAT hardware and routers and all that's that equipment? A, that's a very good question. Matter of fact, uh, they were at the beginning because they were not ready. What happened is Cisco came, was early in the internet. So their uh, ASIC was designed only for IPv4. So they didn't have enough space in order to put IPv6 in ASIC so that you have the same speed between IPv4 and IPv6. While Juniper came late, so they added V6 in ASIC. So at the beginning, up to 2003, Cisco could do only IPv6 on software. So the speed of IPv6 was just 10% compared to 
IPv4. But in the meantime, they have ASIC uh, all over. And every single vendor on planet has IPv6. And in the forum, we have a test uh, program called the IPv6 Ready Logo Program. And they get a logo for this one. It's very difficult to do. And we have about 800 products that have passed the release. By the same token, the US government has taken the IPv6 Forum Ready logo and instituted it as 1st of July. Any product purchased by the US government will have to have the logo. Otherwise, they will not buy it. So this is where the Americans, as one single country, they can think as one. While Europe is 27, everyone has this tune. And they don't tune as well. There is no you know, kind of orchestra. It's, it's a cacophonic orchestra. But the European Commission has done tremendous work, awareness, research, and so on and so forth. But the follow-up by the national countries is, uh, is, is different. Some Spain has been very good on IPv6, uh, the government, as well as the uh, uh, local authorities. Telefonica has been slow in deploying that. So if Telefonica did the V6, then you will have it everywhere. You should ask Telefonica if you are the, the customer that you need V6. Otherwise, you'll fire them, and you should. Huh? Any question? Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you.